So good morning, October the 9th, 2014. This is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Today is day number 14 into week number 7. So let's get started. First of all, good morning and welcome back to this day number 14 into week number 7. Here we are. And we just wanted to let you know that if anyone calls in and says they're with the corporate office, just not to give them any information and not to believe them. Cause, okay. Because apparently if people have been calling in and, you know, just, just making prank calls, I, I assume. Okay, great. Okay, and, and who's this okay, I'm thanks for letting us know. Sure, who's this I'm speaking with? So, you know, your last name? Don R-E-M-O-N-T. Okay, and um, what's your employee number, or, or I guess we can look up by your cell phone number, whatever phone number's on file with us. Um, wait, you just call my partner number? Uh, sure. One, three. Okay, but do you have a phone number? Because that, that's the easiest way to look up your file here. Uh, I think. And, and you remember that part where I, I, said, I said not to give out personal information to anyone pretending to be the corporate office? Why did you just give me all that? I don't know. I, I'm, don't a prank, know. I'm a prank caller. Because, you, because I figured the person telling me that wouldn't, you know? <laughs> now I have your phone number and your, and your spelling of your last name. I already found your Facebook. And now I'm just going to be stalking you forever. Okay. Don't you feel dumb? Do you feel dumb? Yes or no? Answer. How do you plead? Dumb or not dumb? Call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. One, five, this four, is that, is three is like not this. available. At the cell, please record your message. Hi, this is uh, Chad from Verizon Wireless, and I'm calling for Grace. And I was just calling to let you know that we have this problem where people are calling and pretending to be with Verizon and asking for information, personal information. We just wanted to warn you not to give out any personal information, and I'm going to call you back pretty soon and get your address from you. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello. Oh, hello. Is this the manager? Um, she's actually not in right now. Um, she wants to leave a message or, oh, well, or this, figure out how you with anything. This is Brian from the corporate office. I need to know how much, how many pounds of coffee you have currently there at the store. How many pounds are here right now? Yeah. Um, just an estimate. I mean, that's probably going to take some time to count all the pounds of coffee. Okay, well, I'll hold. I'm, I'm sorry, with that? I'll hold. You heard? I'll hold. You oh, heard? Good. 
I said I'll hold. This is Craig oh. from the corporate office. <laughs> okay. Um, or maybe I said something else. Uh, do you know what store number this is? Oh, no. Which one? I don't know. I'm asking. You know what? Could you call back in a few minutes? Um, are you going to have all the pounds ready for me? Um, I mean, probably not in a few minutes. But um, I actually have to double check some stuff first. Um, can you tell me what color your cash register is? What color? Yeah, it's important. It's for the inventory. Um, you, you know what? Can you actually call me back in a few minutes? I'm sorry. I can give you all this information in a few minutes. Oh, sure. But before you hang up, can you tell me how many light bulbs are in the ceiling? Okay. Bye. Hi, this is Daniel from the corporate office. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, I just called to let you know that uh, we've been having a problem with uh, s some, I guess, scam artists or pranksters or something. They've been calling and pretending to be the corporate office and asking for information. Uh -huh. And um, just, uh, just kind of calling to give everyone a heads up to not okay. give out information over the phone. Okay. And, and what did you say your name was again? John. John, and, and the last name? And um, what's your employee number? Can I help you? Oh, I was talking to John. Um, is this the manager? Um, I'm the manager on duty. Okay. Thank you for you. This is Steven from the corporate office. Um, I need to get John his uh, employee number. Um, from the which corporate office? The Starbucks. Okay. Which location? It's for the payroll. Okay. Need to make sure that you're. We've had we scammers call us sometimes, oh. so I need to make sure that you're actually who you say you are. Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard about that. Okay, hold on. Hey, John, this is partner number. It's a one, three. Oh okay, great. Okay. That's all. We need. And and who's this I'm speaking with again? Uh, and what's your employee number? Eight, one, three. Okay, and um, how many light bulbs are in the ceiling? We need to know that for our inventory. Uh, the, the long bowl? Yeah, bowl of all. All of them? Uh, in the whole store or out in the cafe or? Oh, just in the, yeah, just in the whole store. Okay. Um, do you need separate counts or just total number of light bulbs? Oh, just total, total number, like right now off the top of your head. Um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, six, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty. I can't believe you're doing it. Uh, probably about 50-ish. Okay, and how many pounds of coffee are, are there right now? How many what? Pounds of coffee you have there currently on inventory on hand? I have no idea. A lot. We're, we're going to need you to count the individual beans. Yes. Haha. Uh -huh. Could, could you get right on that thing? Yeah. Well, we'll hold. Yeah. Can we get your employee numbers again? Both of them, please. <laughs> I think I'll hold. Not much of an hour Hi, my name is Ryan Cohen. I'm here with the corporate office. Uh, we just wanted to let you know. Did you guys get the memo about people calling in and uh, you know there were a bunch of pranksters and fraudsters calling around trying to get uh, employee numbers and personal information uh, from you know unsuspecting employees? Did you guys get that memo? Yeah. Um. Not that I can answer your question, but I can. It's um, actually in the bathroom right now. Oh. So. I'll, uh, well, you can. This is store uh, nine six, right? Uh. Nine, yes, sir. It should be on the wall. Um, actually, it's definitely. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's marked wrong here in the spreadsheet for some reason. Oh, okay. No, no, no. No, that's the health certificate, sir. That's the health certificate. That's not the, uh, the store number. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, by the way, can I get your uh, first name, please? Alan. A L L A N. Your your last name, sir. And can I have a partner number, please? Five. Five? Yeah. Uh, are you, sir, I have to ask, this is a test from the corporate office. I just told you uh, over the phone not to get personal information out. And you uh, gave me your employee number. You know what? I, I, could, I could log in right now to the, to the Starbucks website and do all sorts of crazy stuff right now with that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. 
Oh, yeah, you're going to get totally reprimanded for this. I'm, I'm going to call in the morning and reprimand you. No, sir. Look, I'm really sorry. Um, I, I didn't know what to do. You should be sorry. You should be really disappointed in yourself. I, I won't reprimand you if you if you think about what you've done and you look real sad when you do it. Hold on okay? Okay. All right. Um, we have 26 minutes of this exam post, a full call. Con artists, coin anybody working in a station, and in this particular case, it's a Starbucks. Now you might be working part time sometime in a specific company, and all of a sudden. At your station, you might receive a call from someone who pretends to be very professional or maybe a senior in your company asking you to do something which is very much ordinary, ask to report your duty, to check on something which is some of your regular routine. And in the process of doing that, what did that person ask for? Specific name, employee number, and using the kind of tricks that he or she knows that you will be around getting in touch with. And then it gives information as if you're reporting to your senior. Now this is the kind of um, techniques uh, social engineers use, and particularly as introduced by Kelvin today on Monday, if you know that this is the kind of thing you need to watch for. And for a student, what do you need to watch for when someone asks you for a student number? Okay? When someone asks you some of the specific things on campus, anybody who pretends to need help. Okay? Now, this is a society. We, we want to entrust the people the best of our human um, kindness. We want to help. Okay? But sometimes in the process of helping, we're giving our sensitive information of our home, of our unit, of our company that we do not know. Now, in the next episode, I put down a forum questions there to invite you to type in some of your personal experience of receiving phone call. Because you know that today, a lot of the company buy personal data from marketing companies, okay? Uh, from different company, they will call you directly and ask you if you want some services, including CDM in my car, okay? Including different company in Hong Kong, they will call you and tell you, or even, even banks, they sell you products. So that this is the kind of thing you can identify. But sometimes when you receive a phone call, uh, even in Macau, judicial police and producer for commercials, helping the elderly not to trust anything when they tell you your son has some problem with that uh, piece of deposit money there or there, right? So that is a direct trap. Now let's take a look at another very interesting thing. I do not need you to watch all of this, but this is a, a hacker doing a talk in heaven. Uh, series and telling you how, in the process of this talk, is demonstrating the strict okay, to obtain your personal information. All right, let's see a couple of things. <laughs>
This is a project I worked on when we were trying to figure out uh, the security properties of wireless networks. It's called the HackerBot. This is a robot we built that can drive around and find Wi-Fi users, drive up to them and show them their passwords on the screen. We just, we just wanted to build a robot, but you know, we didn't know what to make it do, so. We made the pistol version of the same thing. This is called the Sniper Yagi. It's, uh, for your long range password sniffing action about a mile away, I can watch your wireless network. This is a project I worked on with Ben Lorry to show passive surveillance. So what it is, is a map of the conference called Computers Freedom and Privacy. And this conference was in a hotel. And what we did is we um, you know, put a computer in each room of the conference that logged all the Bluetooth traffic. So as everybody came and went with their phones and laptops, we were able to just log that, correlate it, and then I can print out a map like this for everybody at the conference. This is Kim Cameron, the chief privacy architect at Microsoft. Unbeknownst to him, I got to uh, you know see everywhere he went. And I can show, I can correlate this and show you know who he hangs out with. When he got bored, hangs out in the lobby with somebody. Anybody hear your cell phone? So my phone is calling. Calling. Uh oh. What about Chris? So we're in Brennan's voicemail. Um, and I was going to record him a new message, but I seem to have uh, pressed an invalid key, so we're going to move on. Um, and I'll explain how that works some other day because we're short on time. Um, anybody here use MySpace? MySpace is voicemail. No. Used to be popular. It's kind of like Facebook. Uh, this guy, a buddy of ours, Sammy, was trying to meet chicks on MySpace, which I think is what it used to be good for. And um, what he did is, you know, you had a page on MySpace about him that lists all your friends, and that's how you know you're somebody's cool is they have a lot of friends on MySpace. Well, Sammy didn't have any friends. So he wrote a little bit of JavaScript code that he put in his page so that whenever you look at his page, it would just automatically add you as his friend. And it would skip the whole acknowledgement response protocol of saying, is Sammy really your friend? But then it would copy that code onto your page so that whenever anybody looked at your page, it would automatically add them as Sammy's friend, too. And it would change your page to say that Sammy is your hero. So in under 24 hours, Sammy had over a million friends on MySpace. Uh, you know, hey, uh, he just finished serving three years probation for that. Even better, Christopher Abad, this guy, another hacker, also trying to meet chicks on MySpace, but having spotty results. Some of these dates didn't work out so well, so what Abad did is he wrote a little bit of code to connect MySpace to Spam Assassin, which is an open source spam filter. It works just like the spam filter in your email. You train it by giving it some spam, train it by giving it a little bit of legitimate email, and it tries to use artificial intelligence to work out the difference, right? Well, he just trained it on profiles from girls he dated and liked as legitimate email, profiles from girls he dated and not liked as spam, and then ran it against every profile on MySpace. <laughs> Outspits girls you might like to date. I think, you know, what I say about ABAT is I think there's like three startups here. I don't know why we need Match.com when we can have spam dating. You know, this is, this is innovation. He's got a problem, he found a solution. Anybody use these uh, keys for opening your car remotely? They're popular in, well, maybe not Chicago. Uh, yeah. So kids these days will drive through a Walmart parking lot, but you open, 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 open. Eventually you find another Jetta or whatever, just like yours, maybe a different color, that uses the same key code. Kids will just loot it, lock it up and go. Your insurance company will roll over on you because there's no evidence of a break-in. For one manufacturer, we figured out how to manipulate that key so that it will open every car from that manufacturer. 
there is a point to be made about this, which I barely have time for, but it's that your car is now a PC. Your phone is also a PC. Your toaster, if it is not a PC, soon will be, right? And I'm not joking about that. And the point of that is that when that happens, you inherit all the security properties and problems of PCs. And we have a lot of them. So keep that in mind. We can talk more about that later. Anybody use a lot of this on your front door? Okay, good. Um, I do too. This is a Schlage lock. It's on half of the front doors in America. I brought one to show you. Um, so this is my Schlage lock. This is a key that fits the lock but isn't cut right, so it won't turn it. Anybody here ever try to pick locks with tools like this? All right, got a few few nefarious lock pickers. Um, well, it's for kids with OCD. You've got to put them in there and fit it with them, spend hours getting the finesse down and manipulate the pins. You know, for the ADD kids in the house, there's an easier way. I put my little magic key in here, put a little pressure on there to turn it, smack it a few times with this special mallet, and I just pick the lock. We're in. It's easy. And in fact, I don't really know much more about this than you do. It's really, really easy. I have a keychain I made of the same kind of key for every other lock in America. And um, if you're interested, I bought a key machine so that I could cut these keys, and I made some for all of you guys. So my gift to you, come afterwards, and I will show you how to uh, pick a lock and give you one of these keys you can take home and try on your door. Anybody use these uh, USB thumb drives? Yeah, print my Word document. Yeah, um, they're very popular. Um, mine works kind of like yours. You can print my Word document for me. But while you're doing that, invisibly and magically in the background, it's just making a handy backup of your My Documents folder and your browser history and cookies and your registry and password database and all the things that you know you might need someday if you have a problem. So we just like to make these things and litter them around at conferences. Um, anybody here use credit cards? Oh, good. Yeah, so they're popular and wildly secure. Um, well, there's new credit cards that you might have gotten in the mail with that letter explaining how it's your new secure credit card. Anybody get one of these? You know it's secure because it has a chip in it, um, an RFID tag, and you can use these in taxi cabs in a Starbucks. I brought one to show you by just touching the reader. Anybody seen these before? Okay, uh, who's got one? Bring it on up here. <laughs> there's, a, there's a prize in it for you. Um, I just wanna show you some things we learned about them. I got this credit card in the mail. I really do need some volunteers. In fact, I need one, two, three, four, five volunteers because the winners are gonna get these awesome stainless steel wallets that protect you against the problem that you guessed I'm about to demonstrate. Bring your credit card up here and I'll show you. I want, I want to try it on one of these uh, awesome new credit cards. Okay. Um, so somebody can, do we have like a conference organizers where you can force people into cooperating? It's really, it's by, by your own volition because, you know, okay, so this is, a, this is where the demo gets really awesome. I know you guys have never seen, what's that? They're really cool wallets made of stainless steel. Okay. Anybody else seen uh, code on screen at TED before? Yeah, this is pretty awesome. Okay. Um, okay, great, I got volunteers. So who has one of these exciting credit cards? Okay, here we go. I'm about to show your credit card number, only to 350 plus friends. Hear the beep? That means someone's hacking your credit card. Okay, what did we get? Valued customer and the credit card number expiration date. Um, it turns out your secure new credit card is not totally secure. Uh, anybody else want to try yours while we're here? Beep. Let's see what we got. So we bitched about this and Amex changed it so that it doesn't show the name anymore, um, which is progress. You can see mine. Yeah, it shows my name on it, or that's what my mom calls me anyway. Oh, yours doesn't have it. Okay. 
Anyway, so the next time you get something in the mail that says it's secure, um, send it to me. <laughs> oh, wait, one of these is empty. Hold on. I think this is the one. Yeah, here you go. You get the one that's this is empty. All right, cool. Um, okay. I still have a few minutes yet left, so I'm going to make a couple points. Oh, shit. That's my subliminal messaging campaign. It's supposed to be much faster. Okay. Here's the uh, most exciting slide ever shown in TED. This is the protocol diagram for SSL, which is the encryption system in your web browser that protects your credit card when you're sending it to Amazon and whatnot. Very exciting, I know. But the point is, hackers will attack every point in this protocol, right? I'm going to send two responses when the server is expecting one. I'm going to send a zero when it's expecting a one. I'm going to send twice as much data as it's expecting. I'm going to take twice as long answering as it's expecting. I'm going to just try a bunch of stuff, see where it breaks, see what falls in my lap. When I find a hole like that, then I can start looking for an exploit. Right? This is a little more what SSL looks like. Hackers, that's what's boring. This guy kills million Africans a year. It's an awfully defensive mosquito carrying malaria. Is this wrong talk? This is a protocol diagram for malaria. So what we're doing in our lab is attacking this protocol at every point we can find. Right? It's a very complex life cycle that I won't go into now, but it spends some time in humans, some time in mosquitoes. And what I need are hackers, because hackers have a mind that's optimized for discovery. They have a mind that's optimized for figuring out what's possible. You know, I often illustrate this by saying, if you, you know, get some random new gadget, show it to your mom, she might say, well, what does this do? And you'd say, mom, it's a phone. And instantly, she would know exactly what it's for. But with a hacker, the question is different. The question is, what can I make this do? I'm going to take all the screws out, take the back off, and break into a lot of little pieces. But then I'm going to figure out what I can build from the rust. That's discovery. And we need to do that in science and technology to figure out what's possible. And so in the lab, what I'm trying to do is apply that mindset to some of the biggest problems humans have. We work on malaria, thanks to Bill Gates, um, who asked us to work on it. This is uh, how we used to solve malaria. It's a drill ad from like the 40s. We eradicated malaria in the US by spraying DDT everywhere. Um, in the lab, what we do is a lot of work to try and understand the problem. This is a uh, high-speed video. We have a badass video camera um, trying to learn how mosquitoes fly. And you can see that they're more like swimming in air. We actually have no idea how they fly. But we have a cool video camera, so we, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, cost more than a Ferrari. Anyway, we came up with some ways to take care of mosquitoes. Let's shoot them down with laser beams. Uh, this is what happens, you know, when you put one of every kind of scientist in the room and uh, the laser junkie. So um, people thought it was funny at first, but we figured out, you know, we can build this out of consumer electronics. It's using the CCD from a webcam, the laser from like a Blu-ray burner, the laser galvos from a laser printer, this, uh, we do motion detection on a GPU processor like you might find a video game system. It's all stuff that follows Moore's law. So it's actually not going to be that expensive to do it. The idea is that we would put a like perimeter of these laser systems around a building or a village and just shoot all the mosquitoes on their way into the on humans. And uh, we might want to do that you know, for your backyard. Uh, we can also do it to protect crops. Our team is right now working on characterizing what they need to do the same thing for the pest that has wiped out about two thirds of the, um, uh, I think it's about two thirds of the orange groves in Florida. So um, people laughed at first. This is a video of our system working. We are tracking mosquitoes live as they fly around. Those crosshairs are put there by our computer. It just watches them, finds them moving, and then it aims a laser at them to sample their wing beat frequency. Figure out from that, is this a mosquito? Is it an Ophelis defensi? Is it female? If all that's true, then we shoot it down with a lethal laser. 
so we have this working in a lab, we're working on that, taking that project into the field now. Um, all this happens uh, at the Intellectual Ventures Lab in Seattle where I work, and we try and take on some of the hardest problems that humans have. Um, this is a money shot. You can see we just burned his wing off with a UV laser. He's not coming back. <laughs> um, kind of vaporized his wing right there. Yeah. They love it. I mean, you know, never got called by PETA or anyone else. I mean, there's, it's, a, it's the perfect enemy. There's just no one coming to the rescue of mosquitoes. Sometimes we overdo it. Uh, yeah, so anyway, um, I'm gonna get off stage. This is the Intellectual Ventures Lab where I work. Basically, we use uh, every kind of scientist and one of every tool in the world to um, work on crazy venture projects. Thanks. Thank you very much. Have you seen what's happening here? This guy is a very famous scientist now, and he was supposed to be a hacker. He used the tricks, okay, to turn himself into a discoverer with the mindset of a scientist and with the support of some guy like you gave, set up his lab in Seattle, the venture lab over there, and you in the sign. What you have seen here is the kind of things which can help you to understand meanings of information security, first of all, an example of physical lock, okay? I think all of us have locks at home, okay? And for me, I try several times to lock myself out of my house, I need to invite someone here to open the lock for me. And if a person is very skillful in opening the lock, pick up the set of tools, and so you did, and just take it into my lock, less than two minutes, my lock is open. People are that kind of skill. And I say, wow, you can, all, you can actually enter any home. Sure, you won't do that. Okay? So that is the ethical standard of the skills that they learn. The second thing he mentioned and demonstrated to you is, please take a look at your credit card if you have one. And see if the credit card is what we call our FID base. Normally, it is not. Okay. Our FID is a technology that is also used in our library to trace where the book is. For example, you go to the library based on the catalog number. You know that book is supposed to be in that shelf at that particular corner based on the column number. It was not there. For a library which has hundreds of thousands of books, the next thing you can do, as I did very often, I go to the counter and say, I cannot find this book. Fill in the form first. We will look for you, but we can guarantee when we can get it and as soon as possible. Because when you have finished reading the book, okay, you might not put it back where it is. You put it somewhere else. When the library is that big, it takes time to, to identify where the book is. So the RFID technology is good because for each book, they put a specific tracing circuit there, and then if they want to locate where the book is, if it's within the library, they just go to read the code. And then there is a mapping to tell the persons where the book is in the library. And then you can go proceed to that shell and look it up. It's just like when you lost your phone, or you better say, you forgot where your phone is, and your wife or your kid will tell you, call yourself, and if you hear the ring, and you look it up, okay? So it's very convenient. Now what does it mean when it becomes your credit card out at 90 days? What's the convenience? Or what is the problem? The problem that is demonstrated by Pebbles is he, people can use a very simple card reader. And only with card reader, card reader does not have to touch your car, just walk across you. And that card reader can read what's whatever in your pocket. And you see what information is Okay. So check it out. And the third thing, well, that is the very first thing to demonstrate you. you. You you've ever been to a hotel room, right? You live there and you're on your particular holiday. But you might notice, you might not notice that when you try to interact with a hotel TV or phone system, if some hack is not in who has the device. Okay, you can actually trace what you're doing with your TV interactions. A 
included looking at some of the uh, money transactions you have with the hotel. And not only will you do that, you can key in your credit card information. And you can read all of these. Your presumably is going to be safe. But when a hacker is there, positions the devices there, he's actually collecting information from all the hotel rooms. some of your personal experience of receiving phone calls um, when people ask you for some information that you totally think it's not the thing.
think this is also good. Let's go for it. For TAP, the Department of Homeland Security says they've seen 50,000 recent incursions or attempts. That's just on government computers. So what about your home computer or your laptop? As we put cybersecurity in focus this morning, our Ted Rollins takes a look at how easy it is for someone to hack right into your laptop. Inside Terminal 5 at the Los Angeles International Airport, dozens of people are on their computers. Gregory Evans is a former hacker whose resume includes two years in federal prison. We were doing almost a million dollars, if not more, a week against some of the biggest corporations in the world. We set up in a corner of the terminal so that Evans, who now owns a cybersecurity company, could show us just how vulnerable people are to hackers. I would go and set up a fake Wi-Fi and watch everybody connect to it. And once they connect to it and they start surfing the internet, now what I'll do is just grab all their traffic. We launched a fake network named LAX Free Wi-Fi with admitted people started connecting to it. Evans then showed us how a hacker can record everything off a computer that joined our network by tracking what I was doing on my laptop. So if they go to their bank, it'll grab all their banking information. If they go to their Facebook, it'll grab all that. Their Twitter accounts, if they're writing love letters, I can grab all of that. Or, Evan says he forced, if a hacker has enough time, spyware can be installed, which stays with the victim. You get on the plane, you go to one country, I go to another. But everything that you do, as long as you have that computer, is going to be emailed back to me. During our experiment, we stumbled across what appeared to be a real hacker at work. Along with our fake network, there was another one called Free Public Wi-Fi. Airport administrators told us T-Mobile is the only authorized Wi-Fi provider. So you think that there could be a hacker here right now? That's correct. Catching and prosecuting a hacker, especially at an airport, is extremely difficult. E.J. Hilbert is a retired FBI agent who specialized in cybercrime. It's virtually impossible to catch him. Law enforcement's aware of this, and there's always the next piece. You steal the card, you steal the information, you got to use them somewhere. And that's when we start getting the real investigations going. And experts say there are a few things you can do to protect yourself. If you're at an airport or a public spot, find out who the Wi-Fi provider is and use that. If it costs some money, pay the money. They also say change your password every now and then and use different passwords for different accounts. Another tip, turn your computer off when you're not using it. And if you do go online using a public Wi-Fi, keep in mind that someone may be watching you. You don't know if you're getting on a true Wi-Fi or you're connecting to some hacker's network. Like, you don't know if you're connecting to me or if you're really connecting to the airport. Tech Rollins, CNN, Los Angeles. Now the question is, when you're talking about the local computer, now every one of us has a smartphone. A smartphone is also able to go with Wi-Fi. And when you go to a, what you call a hotspot, you believe you're using some free Wi-Fi, very careful, because the phone is with you, has much more private data. And so some of the people will say, well, we never use the Wi-Fi, we use 4G or 3G, which is the private uh, connectivity provided by your company. That's, that's much more secure, okay? So if you have ever experienced like that, you're welcome to share that in the forum that you take risk with you without the devices, which is so mobile. Right? It's a very interesting thing that, that happens. where I highly recommend that you come back to visit it often to get updated on the situations of concerns in the cloud. All right? So it's a very it's a proud we have a center like this. Okay? You can actually come here by clicking on the links here.
You probably have a credit card equipped with it, technology designed to make paying for transactions faster and more convenient. Sounds like a no-lose proposition. That is, until the Contact 5 investigators discover this tool can make you more of a target to pickpocketers. And even more alarming, they can steal without even touching your credit card. Contact 5 investigator Katie LeBron joins us with this eye-opening special report. Katie? Kelly, Jim, every major credit card company is now offering what they call these contactless cards. Essentially, it lets you make a purchase with just the wave of your credit card. The problem? Some say cards with that symbol make you vulnerable to an untraceable crime. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Augustinowitz is an ordinary Joe, exposing what he calls an extraordinary threat. Let's see where you ever picked that up. I think that's crazy. But before we can explain the reasons behind this, ah. and to think that you're so vulnerable, you need to know more about what's inside here. It's called radio frequency identification. It's technology the size of a grain of rice, but it's so powerful. It can track people and things around the globe. And most recently, RFID chips like this have been implanted in credit cards so you can pay without ever sliding your plastic. Neon to me, that's pretty scary. And that's what has Walt Augustinowitz more than just a little nervous. Putting it on a credit card where it's actually you know, transmitting your, your credit card number, I think that's a very bad idea. A former insurance IT guy, Augustinowitz, is now devoting himself to sounding the alarm over what can happen when RFID and credit cards collide. They can broadcast your information without your knowledge. His company, Identity Stronghold, sells products like these that shield information transmitted through RFID. Among his clients, the federal government. From Homeland Security, FAA, TSA. Some might look at you, Walt, and say, you're just in it for the money. You're trying to, you're scaring people into buying. We hope we're scaring people because if you don't know that danger's there, you don't know to protect yourself. So if the credit card companies aren't going to tell the people, we are. It just looks like I'm walking down the street and this is my laptop, right? Walt sets out to prove what he claims. It's that fast. In the WPTV newsroom, we quickly find our first victim. Hi, this is Rochelle. What News Channel 5 reporter Rochelle Ritchie doesn't know is inside Walt's shopping bag is a gadget that can read the RFID chip embedded in her credit card. Wow. Which means Walt just got her digits. Seriously? Without ever touching her card. It took you, what, like a second just to boom, and then you had it. So that's pretty surprising. That bothers me a lot. Here's your piece of number right there. Oh, wow. I can do that on my wallet in my back pocket. Wow. My money's gone. <laughs> you know, in a flash. I mean, that is the worst. It monitors uh, up to 300 feet. Meet Taraj Kafari. He designs RFID technology, which is why we didn't expect to hear him say this. Uh, it's dangerous. I, I agree with you. Kafari says credit cards with RFID technology should not be so easy to hack. In fact, he says solving the problem already exists and would cost credit card companies just pennies to fix. The whole card is 30 cents, therefore they can remove all the bad cards, give them a new card, and they solve the problem. Major credit card companies we contacted insist cards embedded with RFID chips are as secure as traditional credit cards. Card members are not held liable for fraudulent charges. And even if a card number is stolen, a thief can't make an internet or phone purchase without that three-digit security code on the back. Yes, I'd like to place an order, please. Only no one asked us for the code when we used Rochelle Ritchie's digits to buy from a major retailer. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, we just bought Rochelle a small red tote. Yeah. And how much was that so I know? $22.90. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's, um, that's ridiculous. It's an um, electronic pickpocket. Yeah, that is scary. So you think if consumers have a choice right now, they should opt for a credit card that doesn't have this RFID technology. If it's not protected, that means I'm not protected. I, I don't want to use it. You might as well sit there and print your credit card number across your t-shirt and walk around with it because it's standard. Now you can get a credit card without RFID technology. Just contact your credit card company and explain you want a traditional card. You can also keep the card you have 
and buy a shield that looks something like this. It'll cost you about 20 bucks for a handful of them. Or you can take a look at your house and use good old fashioned aluminum foil. Surprisingly, <laughs> Kelly Jim, this will do the same thing a shield like this will do. I'm gonna wrap all my cards. <laughs> well, so, yeah. so is it easy for the thieves though to get a hold of that technology that can read the cards so easily? Is that really cheap and all that kind of stuff? Yes, yeah, surprisingly, absolutely. In fact, we found some of these gadgets online. You can buy all the equipment you need for about a hundred bucks, if that. So we want viewers to know this though, so they can go ahead and take the action they need to protect themselves. Yeah, boy. Everybody's going to be wanting to know more about this story. Yeah. Go to the kitchen drawer and get out the foil. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. How eye-opening. Thank you very much. All right. Now you see some basic story. Um, that helped to understand it more about this kind of credit card RFID payments. Okay. So continue to come back to your forum and see if you've got some ideas for us to share. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I've received a phone call with the sound of a man that protects a girl crying and asking for help. The guy called me, Mom, it's ridiculous. All right, I do not have a daughter, even I haven't got the mercy. I know that must be a fraud. Also received a call, a lady said to a stump from AXA. <laughs> Want to collect my medical record? personal data of my family members for providing us a suitable insurance product. Thank you for sharing this personal experience. Yeah, we got something like this. Okay. I haven't met any fraud in the past. I've just received that someone called me to help me for a finished questionnaire for their school project. Okay. All right. Sometimes uh, this is also one of the very common scam. Okay. Uh, is very interesting. Any, any, any more? Okay, let's see. All right. So let me show you a little bit of the what we call the job scan stuff. Uh, this is a very interesting. Oh, yes, yeah, my time. Nigeria. No, wrong. Let's try this one. Right. Are you looking for a job? In this job market, good secure positions are not easily found. It's definitely an employer's market. Some people are desperate for work. It is in economic times like these that scammers and thieves can do the most damage. Take working from home, for example. The idea is enticing. No traffic, no gasoline or commuting charges, and no rushing around each morning. It sounds almost too good to be true, and in most cases, it isn't. One of the most common online job scams is called the money mule scam. And if you, a family member, or a friend is looking for a job, especially if you're looking for a job online, this Kim Commando video essay just may save you some time, legal trouble, and money. But first, a word from our sponsor, Carbonite.com. A lot of what I share with you here at TVKim.com is intended to help you avoid having a case of the computer should us. For example, if your computer crashed today, would you be saying, I should have used Carbonite to back up my files? Well, we both know that should have won't help you get those files back. And that's why I use Carbonite on my backup, and I highly recommend that you do too. Carbonite automatically backs up your files to a safe off-site location, so that when you have a computer disaster, it'll be really easy to get your files back. And you can now access your backup files from any computer, or even on your iPhone or your Blackberry, with a free Carbonite app. As a TV Kim viewer, you get a free 15-day trial, plus two months free if you decide to buy. Find out how easy Carbonite is. Just click on the Carbonite app right over there. They're going to show you everything that you need to know. Carbonite, back it up and get it back. Just a few years ago, no one had ever heard the term money mule. So here's a crash course showing you or anyone looking for a job online how to avoid this dangerous scam. And I'm using the word dangerous here very purposefully. Being a money mule can get you into some very serious legal trouble, even involving federal authorities like the Postal Service and the FBI. A money mule is a term used for someone who is knowingly or unknowingly recruited to launder stolen money and stolen merchandise. They're almost always recruited online, usually through an offer to work at home. So if you answer any kind of work at home ad, your level of risk is high. Your level of caution should be even higher. 
Here's a story posted at a website called CredsOnSecurity.com. It's an interview with a man who was almost duped into laundering money for criminals. And I'm not talking about small-time petty theft. These guys had stolen funds through an online banking fraud operation. So right away, you can see why FBI involvement is a given. The victim said that he had been looking for work online for a website called MyCareerJob.net. The original website using this name was shut down. He said he was recruited as a financial agent, whatever that might mean, for a company called Life Online. All of his communication with the company was through email and text messages. But he says that he became suspicious when the company, his new employer, asked him for his bank account information. It said it was going to deposit funds right into his account. Can you see a problem yet? You may be asking how anyone can be so easily duped. But take another look at Lydon's website. Notice that everything looks official. In reality, all of the images and web content were lifted from other legitimate websites. It looks real. The interactive content even contains video, including this matrix-themed instruction video for so-called agents. Hello, welcome to online agent preparation. Agent preparation will prepare you for your first upcoming letter. Over the next few minutes, you will be told a series of important details about your schedule order. Please pay close attention and feel free to revisit this area or a refresher when you feel it's necessary. In case you haven't put two and two together quite yet, everything is phony, including that silly computerized voice. There are no financial agents here, just dupes, acting as money mules for organized criminal enterprises. Again, remember the rule. If it looks too good to be true, it isn't. And also consider that developing a slick looking website isn't that difficult or time consuming. Just because the website looks legitimate doesn't mean that it is. Okay, another angle of the money mule scam involves merchandise. I'm talking about cameras, electronics, televisions, you name it. In this case, it's the reshipping donkey or reshipping mule operation. You'll be sent all kinds of products, many of them expensive. Your job is to ship them somewhere else. In this scam, all the merchandise was purchased online using a stolen credit card number. As the reshipper, you're providing the installation between the banks and the merchants. They are the victims here, and the thief. Sometimes you'll be asked to actually buy something yourself, then ship it. Either way, you never get the promised commission. You may, however, get a visit from the FBI. Remember, it was you who shipped the stolen property. By the way, this is what you see if you go to that website I mentioned earlier, mycareerjob.net, and the same thing at liveonline.com. You can bet there are plenty more to replace them. To avoid more scams and for everything digital, visit us again here at tvkim.com. Okay, now this particular answer is not so from an example, but it's given you two important techniques used by hackers or uh, imposters to recruit people online. One, they know that there are a lot of people who can't go to work because of the confinement at home, particularly children's like housewives. But they offer the opportunity that comes by to earn money by getting something done. And that is the money bill in China. Money bill in Chinese is joy no. You see the means and mute, no day, right? Money is money mute, all right? So you, if you become one of the money mute, you're being used, okay, to do something to launder money for organized crime. And one of the examples is, a lot of the hackers steal money from their bank account and move money from this account to the other account. They a lot of the companies act on crime. They create fake checks of a particular bank. Okay? This fake check will be sent to people and use your name to do a transfer with you from your account. Okay? So you believe that you're just doing some proper business transaction, getting money into your account and getting money out of your account with your check or you receive a check from a company. And actually, these are the kind of things that a lot of housewives in the US have done until they discover that they're actually helping people to steal money from them. Different people's account, put it in their own account, in the way, in why in your personal account. So it's very interesting. The second thing is what he, what she mentioned is the, the reshipping the beer. Uh, a lot of the, the, the products or the objects that they need to ship to a destination. They know that the object itself are done or acquired for some kind of crime activity. And they need to launder it clean. And so they need someone to go between to ship that particular object 
out of the track mark, okay, and do it in a clean cycle. And in this particular case, you write some examples. Right? Don't get trapped in this kind of one my job scan. Alright? So indeed, when you look at here, I've given you a lot of very interesting examples. We'll try to read some of this, okay? And it will be very interesting for you to notice that. Now, I would like to come back to the forum to see if you've got some more things for us to take a look at. Alright? So, do we have something more? We got something more from Stephen and friend. Stephen said, I once I have heard a phone call, and that guy who spoke to the phone told my father got some trouble and need money to help. And I just had my phone out and call my father. That is very important. You call the person to get all, make sure everything is in order. Friend said, I've received a phone call said I got a big prize. Which is left off. In order to ensure my identity, I need to give my personal information to pay somebody. That's assuring money, okay? But now I will accept that no phone calls call from here. People will just use more tricks. It's not because we often really, hey, congratulations! I'm calling you because you win the prize. We are from what TV stations? In order to ensure you got a prize, would you please tell us something about this? Well, thank you very much for sharing your personal experience. So, I think it's important that we get ourselves educated um, in order to help people or help our family members or friends understand that. My mom had an experience that someone phone her said I was too loud. Okay. So he asked my mom to give money to save me. And my mom felt so strange to him because my mom knew I was very safe in the school. So my mom interrupted his phone call. So you, you have to be very careful. Um, fortunately, I did not have this kind of experience. But several times, um, while I'm doing my lecture in class, my phone breaks. Okay? And I, I pick up my phone and said, uh, uh, it's a phone call from your son's school, your son is having a fever. Okay, and I'm going to check it, check it out. Something like this. Um, I think it's very important in today's work we need to learn how to be uh, a little bit more careful in terms of doing things like this. And yes, I mean the example that I would like to give you on the job scam part one that's here, let's see. Good evening and welcome to, Date, welcome to Dateline. I'm Ann Curry. For months now, many Americans have watched helplessly as their jobs and bank Good evening and welcome to Dateline. I'm Ann Curry. For months now, many Americans have watched helplessly and have watched helplessly as their jobs and bank accounts have vanished. And too many are falling prey to scam artists who promise easy money in these desperate times. Well, Chris Hansen now investigates how to help you steer clear of these dangers that could trigger even greater financial disaster. Chris? Thanks, Ann. We've investigated a number of scams where you feel badly for the victims, but you kind of wonder, didn't they see this coming? Well, when you see this, you may instead think, gosh, that could have been me. This scam is smooth, complex, and given these tough times, devastating to the people it ensnares. Another major sell-off on Wall Street. The headlines seem to get worse every day. The Dow was down to 1997 levels. The economy in a nosedive. We've lost 3.6 million jobs in this country. Unemployment at record high. First time claims for jobless benefits surged by 7%. And in the middle of it all, internet criminals are now targeting people desperate to find jobs. Officials warn the scam is spreading nationwide. One day. Often with devastating consequences for honest, hardworking families. I'll give you a pair of good lessons. Sunglasses. Carol Browning is a single mom, raising a son, a daughter, and a granddaughter. She has a full-time job, a house in a nice neighborhood, but now she's at risk of losing it all. And I try not to let them see what I'm going through or see me crying or worried about it. But that's got to be stressful. It is. 
Carol got caught up in one of the biggest scams sweeping the country. As you listen to her story step by step, ask yourself, would you have done anything differently? It all began just before Christmas when Carol was searching online for ways to make some extra money. She spotted an ad for what sounded like a perfect part-time job. And they were saying, do you like shopping? Can be a mystery shopper. Do you like shopping? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mystery shoppers are paid by retailers to test whether sales staffs are polite and helpful. Okay, thank you. So Carol signed up online. Before long, got this letter with instructions. It all looked legit. A company name, Mystery Shoppers PLC, an address in New York City. Even a toll-free number she had to call for training before she could start. Her assignment? Shop at a local Walmart to test how helpful the staff is. Then, evaluate the service at Western Union by wiring money to another mystery shopper in a different state. The amount to transfer? Just over $3,000. The company told Carol she didn't have to worry about the money. They'd send a check, enough to cover her shopping trip to Walmart, that big Western Union transfer, and her pay for doing the job. In all, a check for $3,850. Did you wonder for a minute, maybe... Could this hit. be too good to be true? I did. Carol got the check all right, but she was cautious. So before she did anything else, she says she took the check to a teller at her local bank. She read it. And she told me, yeah. Good to go. That's good. You get access to your money tomorrow. And I said, you sure? She said, yes, and not seven day old on it. She said, no, it's clear. Thinking things were on the up and up, Carol followed the instructions. She deposited the check, withdrew the money from her account, went to Western Union, and wired $3,100 to a company contact in Kansas. Everything seemed fine, until a week later, when Carol says she tried to fill up with gas. Her debit card linked to her personal checking account was rejected, so she tried an ATM nearby. And it wouldn't go through and say insufficient funds. Insufficient funds? This was only for $20. So you had nothing in your checking account. Nothing. Turns out that big check was no good. Even though Carol thought she checked it out, even though her bank gave her the money, it turned out to be a sophisticated counterfeit. And you may be surprised to learn that in cases like that, a bank can still reverse the deposit and hold you responsible. And that's exactly what was happening to Carol. Pulled their account up and told me that I was overdrawn three thousand five hundred and some dollars, and I said, "What?" That's a lot of money. My life just turned upside down because, I mean, I could do number five. And I asked the man in the bank, I said, check again because th this, this had to be real. He said, yes, ma'am. The check been recalled and you got to cover the check. In effect, Carol hadn't wired the company's money. She'd sent her own, draining her bank account. And the bad news got even worse. The bank said the regular checks Carol had already written for her mortgage, her car, her utilities, all were bouncing. What's more, when her weekly paycheck from her regular job was direct deposited in her account, the bank seized it to help pay off the debt. I was just devastated. I was just trying to figure out what am I going to do, how am I going to come up with this. What did you do when you got home that night? I got some of my jewelry, my rings and bracelets. I took them to the corner shop and I found them. We wondered, with so many people out of work nowadays, how many cases like Carol's are out there, how much money is being stolen, and who's behind the job scam that are cheating Americans looking for honest work. Join us as we go online and undercover, applying for jobs, and taking you inside the scams. Coming up... A single mom who thought she found a great job online, a payroll clerk. When you print these checks, did they look real? Yes, they do. I have one. In your name, would you like to say? And promises, promises continues. Now, I've just given you the first episodes of this story, and definitely you see the, the kind of consequences faced by this uh, lady. And you can, you're going to see uh, two more stories here. Part two and part three, wrap up the whole scam. Now spend some time at home and uh, read the story, and it could be a very good discussion topic 
with your learning partner and also with your team. And also be a very good proposal for you to do in a, an arts learning contract. Now, I think we have got through 11.15 today, and I would like to remind you, this is the last week for the second learning contract, and you're supposed to complete all the work by the end of this Sunday, okay? So make sure you try your very best. We're still in the second learning contract, that means you can earn only 10% of the whole semester score. Use your experience and try to learn from what you are supposed to learn in managing this small learning project. All right, and I, I believe uh, your first learning contract uh, the work will be returned uh, accordingly within this week. All right, so have a nice day, and I'll see you back next Monday. The questionnaire will be up this Saturday at the last four days. Okay, thank you very much for coming. So that's it for today's CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. Until this, next Monday, stay tuned.